So Roland's kicking me off. Thank you very much. He's coming back in a few minutes, actually. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I ask the uh, first plenary panel to come take the stage, and uh, our moderator, John Billy. Uh I just want to uh, actually one note on, on Chris's excellent uh, uh, keynote. You'll be hearing from Kyle Kimball at lunchtime for a few minutes about um, uh, the work, good work the city of New York is doing. And I think you'll hear the same charge, the same charge to us. We want a great waterfront. We want uh, to maintain the Hudson River Park. We want to subsidize ferry service. It takes revenue. We've got money allocated. We'll need more to protect this harbor as time goes on. So the, I think one of the great challenges for those who care about the waterfront and want a great waterfront is how do we find that revenue? How do we convince the public that this is an asset worth investing in? So with that, I'm going to hand it to John Boulay, and I guess move this microphone out of your way. Thank you, Roland. Um, and thank you, Chris. Hope everyone was taking notes on uh, what Chris was saying. Some excellent points he was making about the future here of the Port Authority and really the larger uh, harbor context. What I, what I want to do now is uh, transition to um, what I like to call the heavyweight panel. Um, you know, we had a visitor about 18 months ago, uh, a visitor named Sandy, and she left, uh, she left uh, a little bit of havoc and destruction in her, in her wake. Uh, but let's not forget, she wasn't the first visitor we've had in a while. Only uh, 12 months or so before Sandy, we were visited by a, a couple of other uh, ladies. Uh, I'm not, sure a boy. If, I'm not sure if Lee was a boy Sandy's or a girl. Sandy's a boy. What's that? Little known fact, Sandy was a boy. Sandy was a boy? Yes. Short, yeah. short for Sanford. I, I, need, I, need, <laughs> I need written documentation of that, Holly, that coming from you. Um, you know, we had, uh, we had uh, Hurricane um, Lee, or Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee visited, and if you were in New York City at that time, uh, you were upset because they closed the subways. If you were in upstate New York, uh, your whole life was turned upside down in some cases. If you were living uh, near the rivers in northern New Jersey, uh, it was another wake-up call uh, for uh, the need for greater resiliency. So two, three, three storms in the last few years, is this an indication of change, real change in our climate, disruption in our climate? Well, what we need to do is we need to talk about that, and, and for the last 18 months, we've been doing that. We've been talking, we've been planning, we've been talking some more. Uh, the distinguished heavyweight panel that I have uh, to my right is going to focus on what actions are being done. You know, a plan's great, but holding up a plan in front of a surge wave is not going to stop your, your uh, infrastructure, your house from being flooded. We're knocked down. What we need is real action, real actions on the edge, real actions in our communities. We need investment. Uh, and to talk about that, uh, we've got uh, four panelists and two respondents. And I'm going to give, they've all got distinguished biographies. Uh, but they've all and also told me that uh, the future is where the real chapters, uh, the, the real highlight chapters of their lives are going to, be, um, going to be made, including the chapter that they're all living through uh, right now. So I'm going to uh, avoid a long uh, introduction to each speaker, but I want to talk first, um, I, want, I want to turn it over to my federal colleague, Holly Light, who's the regional administrator for HUD Region 2, with significant experience in housing development, public space development. Um, for those of you who don't know, HUD led the president's uh, Sandy Task Force. HUD is playing a driving role in the recovery and rebuilding effort, which is obviously centered right here uh, where we're sitting. So I'd like Holly to talk a little bit about uh, her perspective from the federal side on what actions are being done and what lessons were learned. Holly. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I think I'm mostly going to set the larger context. HUD's role, um, though it's often misrepresented publicly in a lot of different ways, HUD's role is not to actually determine typically what projects get done 
uh, with CDBGDR, which is sort of the disaster version of community um, block grants. We work through our grantees, and um, many people at HUD like to say that we are only as successful as our grantees. Our grantees, um, in this case, primarily are the state of New York, the state of New Jersey, and New York City. Um, and we are giving them funding in order to do the projects. And one of the conundrums, of course, of being a federal agency is that people will say to you, well, you're, you don't have boots on the ground. You can't determine how to spend the money. But the minute they don't like how a grantee spends the money, they say to you, why aren't you telling them to spend the money differently? So that's just, I think, the role that we play. But what we are trying to do in the wake of Sandy, and I think um, there is a lot of on the ground lessons being learned as we're going and attempts to look at best practices really since Katrina um, and how to do things better post, post disaster than after Katrina and we're kind of in the process of doing that as we go now. And one of the, the biggest things is how to make sure that we are integrating um, at the federal level as effectively as possible to be supportive of the state and local grantees. Um, as John said, the president put together a task force after Sandy and asked Secretary Donovan to lead it. Um, Jamie actually would know more about this than I do because I was not there at the time, but he was uh, part of the task force. The task force came up with 69 recommendations uh, for, for implementation, everything from dealing with insurance and many of the complexities of the insurance process to more on the ground infrastructure, coastal resilience. Um, and, and a big theme of it was resilience. One of the things that uh, Sandy is very, the Sandy recovery is very focused on is not just to rebuild as we have in the past, um, but to implement more resiliency and protect toward the future. And that's a big theme, both of the task force recommendations, but also the work that we're all doing together now. Uh, the task force ended in September of last year and then that was sort of a big moment of now what, how do we go to implementation. Um, <clears throat> Secretary Donovan was very focused on ensuring that cabinet level focus continued and so he put together what he calls the principles group which continues to meet quarterly of the cabinet members for all the agencies, federal agencies that that are affected and have either permitting or funding or any other role in the ongoing recovery. And in fact, one of those meetings is later today. Um, that has trickled down, I think, to a commitment at the staff level. And most recently, we've been building that capacity at the regional level. So since January, um, HUD and FEMA are co-leading a group in the region here based in, in New York out of an ongoing office, um, Sandy Recovery Office that's located in Queens, to continue that focus coordination. And this regional group uh, is now meeting monthly, but talking daily and having sub-meetings several times a week. Uh, that very focused level of coordination is continuing. Um, we are close to launching 10 technical coordination teams. And these are based on identification of sort of the biggest areas that we know are going to require unprecedented uh, federal coordination to make uh, them happen right. So those teams um, are everything from coastal protection, which is a very large area, and then we'll start identifying projects within that, um, to geographies that we're very focused on. Hoboken, New Jersey City is one, Jamaica Bay is one, the Meadowlands is one. Um, to topics like liquid fuels, how do we make sure that, that those are better protected, waste treatment facilities, the rebuilding and resiliency of those. Um, and we are asking the agencies involved, and there's probably about 20 federal agencies, to commit staff to be part of these teams and to really dig into the implementation at this point. So we're we have completely shifted, I think, from where a lot of us were on looking at large policy things and creating reports to let's now talk about how we're going to get the projects done. Um, another component that, that we have been the lead on is a, is a design competition called Rebuild by Design. This is a pretty innovative um, idea that the secretary had to challenge people internationally to come with proposals for resiliency for the region. And uh, this started with, I think, something over 160 proposals that were honed down to 10 finalists. 
and uh, there was a jury presentation of two days a few weeks ago, and, and some number of those 10 will actually get significant implementation money to move forward with those projects. Um, and that, in terms of implementation, will end up getting folded into this same regional structure we're putting together. The teams will get folded in to those 10 technical teams um, to help with the implementation. So we are, we are sort of at this moment of figuring out how this team then works with the grantees to make sure that they are getting the support they need to implement their projects. And that can go from the most mundane of how do we reconcile procurement rules for FEMA, HUD, and EPA if we're trying to use all of their, their funding um, to the regulatory and permitting. And it's very in the weeds, but I think this is something that the federal government has to sort of learn to do well at a regional lo local level um, if we're going to be as effective as we can be going forward. And I think one of the examples um, that we're working on right now is our first pilot together is the Bay Park uh, Waste Treatment Plant on Long Island, which uh, was, was destroyed. It's on the waterfront. <clears throat> And FEMA put up money for replacement of kind, because that's what FEMA does. So there's $810 million there to replace it with some resiliency. The EPA is looking at that plant and saying, you know, that plant was never really as compliant with what we would like for water quality as we wanted it to be. So if we rebuild that in kind, we're not really going to be happy with the outcome. And HUD is looking at it and saying, if we're going to put CD, BGDR money in, we want to see more resiliency and let's Let's make this better than it was before. So we're working with the state very closely with EPA, with FEMA, to figure out how can we bring money together from multiple sources and take that 810 that FEMA has set aside, but find funding on top of that and put that together to create something that isn't just going to be a more resilient version of what was there, but is really going to make significant improvements, um, maybe even combine a number of plants uh, de denitrify the water better and potentially look to create an outfall pipe that will help the water quality for the community in the future. So those are the kinds of things that um, we're hoping, um, I don't know if that sounds sexy, but it, it's pretty sexy for federal government, um, that we're hoping we'll really dig into in the implementation phase uh, working with, with the two states in the city. Thank you, Holly. Um, I can tell you that uh, there's a lot of engineers out there that thought that was pretty sexy. <laughs> uh, I know Peter Gloss thinks it's pretty, pretty sexy on the other end of the table. Um, I, I will tell you that, you, you know, as, before I turn it over to, um, to our, our state uh, representatives that, you know, resiliency is a regional problem. It's really a national challenge. Uh, who's in the lead? Uh, that, that's a question, you know, everyone wants to know which belly button they can put their finger into. And, um, you know, may, maybe uh, Jamie Rubin and Michelle Sakurka think it's the states that should be in the lead. And the federal government should come uh, support the states and the states should call the shots. And the federal <coughs> money should be uh, funneled into the state's priorities. And uh, maybe Dan Zarelli thinks uh, maybe it's not the state. Maybe it's the city who should be in the lead in, in, within the uh, environs of, of the five boroughs. We'll, maybe we'll hear a little bit about that. But who's in the lead? How is this properly being coordinated because there's never enough resources? Uh, how do we make sure the policies are complementary instead of redundant and uh, uh, conflicting? These are, these are the big challenges, I think, as we move forward. Uh, into implementation and real policy change uh, towards a forward-looking future. So, so I would I would I would like to start with uh, the New York State Rep and, and Mr. Jamie Rubin, who is uh, the director of the the New York State Storm Recovery Office. Uh, before that, as as Holly mentioned, Jamie was a senior advisor to Secretary Donovan uh, on, uh, and he was the New York. Uh, rep on the President's Task Force and uh, of course uh, before that he had a very successful career uh, in the finance industry so they had a huge conference up in Albany uh, yesterday to talk about something called New York Rising and I'm sure Jamie wants to talk about that so I'm going to turn it over to you thanks for joining us Jamie. Thank you John. How's that? Okay there we go. 
Um, so I wrote out my remarks today because I've had some experiences with Marcia, where I, uh, which I'm sure she remembers, and I raise it every time I see her, where I spoke to a group that she asked me to come speak to, and I didn't prepare enough, and I did what I thought was a lousy job. So I'm never going to do that in front of Marcia again. Um, uh, we also, frankly, I wrote things out because we have a lot. We, have, we feel like we've done a lot, and I think the state, um, you know, John made the mistake of baiting me here. Uh, I think we've actually done a hell of a job. Um, we are not great at bragging about the work that we've done. We've had, I think, hit our light under a bush a little bit, and I want to make sure that I get some of the critical details out there. We're going to stop hiding our light a little bit less, I think, going forward. Yesterday's conference was the beginning of that process. Um, you know, fun fact, it turns out that the state capital is in Albany, um, and I think um, for much of the press and for many of the folks who pay a lot of attention, or who think they pay a lot of attention to the kind of work we're doing, uh, if it doesn't happen in New York City, um, it didn't happen, and so we're trying to, um, we're going to try to change that perception a little bit, although another fun fact, I'm actually based in New York City, uh, just downtown. Anyway, um, thank you for inviting me. This is my second consecutive year here. It's a terrific group, and I think exactly the right group to talk about this, uh, this work with. Thank you to Holly. I know what a difficult job she has. As, um, as John said, I worked uh, on the task force, and I worked at HUD. Um, I think it's pretty sexy, um, and we were really quite proud of the work we did as a task force, and certainly have nobody, could not ask for anybody better to turn that work over to for its implementation phase than Holly Light has been uh, so accomplished um, in the city <clears throat> for the last, uh, for her entire career. Okay, um, and of course it's great to be here with all my partners, my local state partners, um, and, uh, and all of you, as well as our, our other federal friends. John, of course, has done great work for us uh, on our program assets. I see my friend Jamie Springer over there and many other people, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've accomplished in the last uh, year and a half since Sandy uh, and what our plan is to advance the recovery on the ground in the months and years to come. A little background, as you know, just after the start of the storm, thanks in large part to the advocacy of my boss, his colleagues, uh, Sean Donovan, uh, the New Jersey governor, and our congressional delegation, as well as uh, the mayor who was um, in office before our current mayor, Congress appropriated $60 billion to support the region's recovery from the storm. About $15 billion of that, as Holly said, went to the Department of Housing and Urban Development to be allocated locally through CDBGDR, and our office was established to manage the state's share of that money, which has been $3.8 billion to date, and I am assured by Holly and her colleagues that much, much more is still to come. <laughs> See, they're all going to be really nice to me today because yeah. the last tranche of money yeah, is uh, imminent. <laughs> this will not be the last of Holly. We'll hear about this. <laughs> From the beginning, we took the approach that execution is fastest and most effective. We put all of our programs under one roof as well as, uh, which just happens to be the same roof where the money is. So our office both controls the money and runs four basic programs. We have a staff of about 15 people who have made almost $500 million available to homeowners in Long Island and upstate whose homes were badly damaged or virtually destroyed. In addition, acting on the governor's declaration right after Sandy that the storm was Mother Nature telling us that there are places we probably shouldn't live, we've announced that we will buy about 400 homes so far in three communities on Staten Island and leave those properties undeveloped, returning them to wetlands and allowing them to protect the, the homes around them for future storms. We're doing the same in a few selected communities upstate. Second, we've given out about $10 million in grants to small businesses, and we'll continue to do so. Many of those, as we're talking about waterfront activity here, many of those you should know are marinas uh, and other waterfront businesses up in Long Island. At least part of that money is designed to help them build protection against future storms, and we expect to put out about $40 million by the end of the year, $40 million more by the end of this year. Third, we have a robust program of what we call infrastructure investment, which will be spent <coughs> on direct infrastructure temp projects, but will also go to help local towns villages and others who got money from FEMA, what is called their local match obligation. When FEMA makes money available for repair of facilities and other infrastructure, um, it asks that the recipients put what they call skin in the game, about 10% in a storm like this, uh, and the state traditionally makes up that 10% for small fiscally strapped local communities, um, and we're going to be spending several hundred million dollars to meet that obligation. Finally, we set up the Community Reconstruction Program about which more later that was the subject of our conference in Albany yesterday that John talked about. Our office also runs the state's hazard mitigation grant program, which comprises about three quarters of a billion dollars so far, allocated by FEMA to the state to support large-scale infrastructure development that promotes resiliency, long-term resiliency, and growth. Finally, in an effort to make sure that 
for once the state's left and right hands are talking to each other, or that, that metaphor probably doesn't really work very well, holding each other's hands or something. Uh, we coordinate the work of the many state agencies that are involved in New York's recovery from Sandy, as well as, of course, from Tropical Storm Lee and Hurricane Irene. We do all of this from an office on Beaver Street that could charitably described as a Class C building <laughs> with a team of about 70 of the most dedicated people you've ever met. And if you come visit us, as Holly and others have done, I recommend that you not drink the water from our water fountain um, and probably not breathe our air. <laughs> this is an immense amount of activity, and I'm proud of what we've accomplished. But since the theme of this conference is execution, I'm pleased to report that I have an incredibly demanding boss who is dedicated to spending federal dollars very quickly on projects that will protect the state from the next major disaster. And we're intent on making our goals public so that groups like this and those in this room can measure our progress. Chris talked about transparency. I think that really is the point of transparency. It's both to protect against um, the kinds of sort of rash political, uh, political decisions that Chris was talking about, also to make sure that our feet are held to the fire and that we deliver in a timely fashion. Just yesterday, at the 2014 <coughs> Reconstruction Conference, we proudly launched 45 community reconstruction plans containing rigorous analysis and proposals for about 700 projects all in, selected by local communities over the last nine months that will altogether direct about $500 million in this first phase into projects that are targeted and guided by those local communities. The projects are modest in size but bold in ambition and taken together they represent what I think is a really revolutionary effort to bring communities to the table to start talking about how to protect themselves and their neighbors. One of the really interesting byproducts of this effort is that we've seen the 600 or so members of our communities, of these committees that are driving the projects, develop an acute awareness of why the weather has become such a threat and why, as John said, we've seen so many major storms over just the last couple of years. I don't think, frankly, that this dialogue was as active before nine months ago as it was, partly as a result of our activity. The plans are posted on our website. I have absolutely no idea what that address is, but we'll make sure that you know what it is. Um, and we fully intend to put our progress up there as well so the people we aim to protect can measure us as we go along. At the same time, we're using the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program to direct money to larger projects with broader protective footprints. So it's a, we've had a bottom-up and also a top-down approach to, uh, to, to recovery from Sandy. In the last few months, we forwarded to FEMA for their approval plans for new canal flood warning systems upstate, reconstruction of critical seawalls and levees, and new training programs for dam inspectors. Right here in New York City, the governor announced a $52.8 million proposal to safeguard Breezy Point, Queens against future storms, calling for the creation of a double dune barrier system. The proposal would provide sustainable natural flood and erosion protection that uh, utilizes the area's natural resources. Overall, approximately 350 homes were lost in Breezy Point, as I'm sure you all remember, as a result of Sandy. More than 10% of the community's roughly 2,700 houses. The governor's committed never to have that happen again. Of course, everything in our office comes against the backdrop of the broader statewide recovery carried out by our partner agencies. Back in January, the governor laid out the details of a $16 billion plan to rebuild and reinforce New York State. The plan highlights investments in infrastructure, weather detection, energy, waste, and drinking water, Bay Park, that Holly talked about, is certainly the signature project in that area. Coastal protection, assistance to homeowners and small businesses, emergency management and response, and transportation. We tried to be, again, as transparent as possible about the details, and we certainly welcome everyone's efforts to keep us working towards those goals. With each of these, with each of these undertakings, we must recognize the great risks that come from rising sea levels, increasing threats from coastal flooding, and worsening trends from highly destructive extreme weather heard the governor say many times, and since he was elected three years ago, there have been at least a uh, hundred year storm every year, and we don't expect anything to change in that regard, so of course our work is doubly urgent. So again, I'd like to thank you for inviting me, um, and I look forward to talking with the rest of my panelists and responding to your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Jamie. And on the theme of um, uh, regional challenges you know if you look over to your left shoulder across the river you'll see a, there's a whole s different state over there it's called the state of New Jersey and you see a little <coughs> bit of uh, Jersey City and, and Hoboken a little bit to the to the north very vulnerable uh, communities um, you know New Jersey was was hit extremely hard uh, and there's so many interdependencies between New Jersey and New York in terms of supply chains and services. Uh, obviously the people, millions of people come in and out of New Jersey into the city uh, throughout uh, the week. Uh, we're connected. 
uh, we can't uh, problem solve at political boundaries. Um, we have to get beyond that and integrate as a regional team. And I'm very excited to hear Holly talk about standing up these regional principles groups to really get at managing and solving uh, these challenges that we have. So representing the great state of New Jersey, um, we have uh, uh, Michelle Sakurka, who's the Deputy Commissioner of the New Jersey DEP. Michelle is the queen of water <laughs> over there in, uh, in the great state of New Jersey. Uh, very involved uh, in, uh, in the New Jersey recovery effort. And uh, Michelle, we'd love to hear what's happening over there in terms of keeping people safer and, and reducing damage uh, to assets uh, on the other side of the Hudson River. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you across the river today from that place called the great state of New Jersey. Um, I always like to start, uh, as we look forward, to just remind us a little of where, where we've come from. But I, I start with the vision of, of Governor Christie in our recovery when he said, you know, part of our long-term recovery, the state is committed to building back better, stronger, including researching resilient infrastructure projects, identifying mitigation opportunities to prevent future damage, utilizing current construction techniques and materials, and to better understand and withstand our ability from future weather events, amongst other things. Our motto in New Jersey, you know, so many say you're in the reason why we had damage in areas that we did is we shouldn't have been there in the first place. We're there for a reason. And so we don't believe in retreat. We believe in rebuild. We believe in rebuild stronger and better. Do it with a sense of resiliency. You know, what we experienced in the wake of Sandy, um, as you experienced here, you know, we had 346,000 homes destroyed by Sandy. We had $2.6 billion of wastewater and water infrastructure treatment damaged as a result of Sandy. We have 231 tidally influenced communities in our state of New Jersey. We need to protect against that for the future. We cleaned up 8 million cubic yards of debris just along the shorelines of New Jersey. And, you know, it's amazing. I think my commissioner must have been a soothsayer. I recall um, a few hours before the storm hit when we were all in our little in our conference room and, and preparing as we were leaving that evening and you know my commissioner having this vision of saying what's going to happen when the surge comes up the Hudson the Hudson I really don't think you know we've talked about that enough and sure enough that's what we experienced a tremendous surge up the Hudson and the thing I like to remind everybody is it is that part of New Jersey across <coughs> the way that even in our own state folks think that we forget about in Trenton is our northern part of the state and the harbor area of the state Trust me, we do not forget about this part of the state. While you hear a lot about recovery at the shore or 127 miles of beach restoration in those projects, they're extremely important, but we recognize the economic viability and we recognize our residents, we recognize everything, the importance that the harbor gives us, and we have a lot of strategies around rebuilding the harbor back more resilient. What are some of the challenges we face um, as we look toward rebuilding with resiliency? My biggest concern consistently is the business as usual mentality. We had three weeks following Sandy where we were without energy in a multitude areas of our state. I always love telling the story of the three weeks I spent at our state police headquarters, you know, trying to get generators around to wastewater treatment facilities as billions of gallons of sewage was dumping into our waterways because we didn't have the right infrastructure. We didn't have the backup generation that we needed. The concern is that 500 plus days post Sandy, 18 months post Sandy, the biggest concern is people forget about what we experienced in the wake and we need to keep the sense of urgency going and we are doing that. You know, I still spend about 88% of my day, every day amongst all my other responsibilities on our Sandy rebuild, sense of urgency is so important. So we will not allow, allow a business as usual mentality. Um, vulnerable systems and a, and a will and a political will for asset management. We're strapped at our local levels. You know, how do we bring resources? The next challenge, obviously, you know, money, not just money, but human resource. How do we continue to train the professionals for the type of infrastructure improvement we need for the future? These are challenges that we need to, that we need to address. Coordination. We have 565 municipalities across 20 counties. Coordination is a huge challenge for us. In our water and wastewater facilities, we have 620 public community systems, 300 of which are municipally owned. 
260 community wastewater systems, 60% of which are publicly owned, and all of our stormwater is managed at the municipal level. And another challenge we have is, as we rebuild, we have to preserve the great diversity we have in our state. We can't have a one-size-fits-all by any means. We need to make sure that we can maintain the rich culture and customs of certain communities as we rebuild. And, and to that, that's why strategies for the shore are so different from strategies for the harbor. So you know, how do we address that, and how do we preserve that? You know, What are some of our successes? What are the things that we've done? We wanted to make sure that we took a comprehensive regional approach to how we were going to rebuild and how we were going to recover. We spent a significant amount of time mapping out our critical assets around the state so that we could have available to us a blueprint for looking at opportunities for clusters and ways of doing business around the state. It gives us a regional approach to permitting. It allows us to assess and prioritize by regions and bring those unique needs, address those unique needs in those areas, and allows us to integrate across municipal lines and look bigger than just in, um, in a small area. Some of our cluster types of initiatives are what we're doing in our um, Blue Acres program. Blue Acres is, um, is buyouts, and we heard a little bit that New York is doing that as well. Our Blue Acres program, our goal is utilizing $300 million of, of our federal recovery dollars in partnership with state dollars toward the purchase of 1,300 homes. We are moving in that process very quickly, and um, we've closed at this point on close to 100 homes, and um, we continue, and this will be a multi-year, many, many years, we will uh, be, be doing this in areas where it makes sense to do this, in areas where it makes sense to restore to our natural infrastructure, not just to get people out of harm's way, but to allow for that natural infrastructure to serve as a mitigation and a flood mitigation for those others in those areas. Where appropriate, another cluster strategy we have is elevations. $100 million of our hazard mitigation dollars is going toward elevating homes out of harm's way. Clearly in diverse, in um, dense populations like Hoboken and Jersey City, that that's not an option, but in other areas that certainly is an option and where we have repetitive flooding taking place in some of our dense areas up in the north, those are opportunities for folks. Energy resiliency, you heard me reference that we had about uh, three weeks, three weeks of, of darkness all around the state and the challenges that that brought. So increasing energy resiliency, um, we've, in, we've taken on numerous initiatives in order to do that. We have $25 million of our hazard mitigation money right now is going toward energy allocation to critical infrastructure around the state toward their backup generation. And we have more dollars coming forward in our next round of HMGP for that. We are establishing a, has a um, energy resiliency bank in the state of New Jersey. And what this will be is specifically to set up programs toward not just backup generation like we would think of it, generators, but clean energy backup generation like combined heat and power, utilizing solar, utilizing fuel cells. So we're using $200 million of our CDBG money to put toward this, working with HUD who has been fabulous and the U.S. Department of Energy and NREL has been working in the state with us for the past year over setting up this program. And we'll match that program with our societal benefits charges costs in New Jersey to ensure that that is a sustainable program in the future. And along the liquid gas line, because we absolutely had that issue. We've established a retail um, gas station program in order to bring resiliency along all of our critical roads in the state of New Jersey so we can assure that people can get around, especially emergency vehicles, because we had tremendous challenge in those few weeks following. Some of the other strategies, though, are looking at you know what was broken before Sandy, how did, because how did that how can that bring some mitigation um, to future flooding? Things like combined sewer overflows. You know, it's an issue in New York and New Jersey. And what we've been able to do in the aftermath of, of Sandy, and we started this before, but you know, Sandy made it obvious to us that we need to take opportunities to fix things that are already broken, like a combined sewer overflow. So um, what we're doing is long-term control plans, which ensure short-term iterative water quality improvement, uh, incorporating green infrastructure. And this is an area where we have a lot of outreach and coordination because we're doing this by way of communities that share these types of infrastructure systems. But it's a holistic view on a sewer shed basis in order to bring resiliency and ensure that we can mitigate against flood in the future. Um, and then also in the area of water and wastewater, what's so important is that we 
encourage, but then follow through regulation on when we rebuild that we do it better. So we've established numerous guidance documents are in the process of rewriting rules <coughs> to ensure that as we rebuild and as we prepare for the future, that our critical infrastructure has proper um, proper opportunities in place for backup generation as well as emergency response and, re and preparedness in, this, in front of a storm. Uh, flood protection, whether it be hard flood proofing, soft flood proofing, wet flood proofing, dry flood proofing. Um, and we have a very vigorous asset management plan that we're beginning to roll out um, that we've already mandated through our combined sewer outfall permits. Um, so, but what would we do? How do we enable this? Right? We enable it through funding, because as I said earlier, one of our biggest challenges is bringing resources, especially to those local municipalities when they're the ones funding these programs. And so what we've been able to do is take some of our federal money um, th that we receive annually through EPA, and we're able to leverage that through the New Jersey Environmental Infrastructure Trust. So over this next two years, we have over $1 billion in our state revolving fund combined with that state with the, our environmental dollars um, toward water and wastewater improvement. These are long-term loans, um, but they're combined with principal forgiveness, and in some regard, up to 20% principal forgiveness. So what we're able to do is get money out on the street at a very, very low cost to municipality with some portion of it. When we say principal forgiveness, it's a really fancy term for a grant. Um, and so we're able to bring re relief to those who have to do this rebuilding. And I'm really proud to talk about the fact that we have the first ever, as we're told, nationally, um, we've created a revolving line of credit, if you will. FEMA money is reimbursement. You have to lay out your money before you get it back. Many of our facilities are eligible for FEMA dollars, but they need to be able to put that money out first. So what we've been able to do through our state dollars and through our Environmental Infrastructure Trust is create a upfront revolving line of credit where we can extend money to our facilities knowing they will be repaid by FEMA. That money comes back and we can continue to lay it back out. This is our way of empowering our systems to get the money to be able to do their recovery quicker. And we're really excited about that program. It's up and running now. And then another thing that we've done on the planning side, and this aligns beautifully with Rebuild by Design, is we took the time to do some comprehensive long-term planning by partnering with academia, six of our state institutions. Um, we call them the university studies, but we asked them to study for us in, in particular areas, opportunities for flood resiliency, whether it be hard structures, natural structures, berms, flood walls, green infrastructure, and, and asked them to come and report back to us. Um, and we have a few projects up in the har harbor that I'd like to spend one moment on. Um, Stevens has been evaluating flood water behavior and structural solutions for the use of flood walls to prevent storm surges for uh, the area of Hoboken and Jersey City. That dovetails with the federal government's um, rebuild by design and the programs that they're looking at. Rutgers has been evaluating studies for various regions across the state, but including specifically the Hackensack River, the Hudson River, and the Arthur Kill, incorporating green infrastructure um, in generic applications that can be used community by community. Um, also looking, though, at seawalls and berms and other non-structural solutions that could provide flood barriers. And then the New Jersey Institute of Technology, when all these studies are done at the end, and there's other studies that are for the shore and for other areas of the state, but. The New Jersey Institute of Technology is taking the approach of evaluating the economic, ecological, and social impact of those proposed recommendations so that we can ensure that we can move them forward to actual implementation. The final studies of these, um, we have drafts right now up on our website, so if you're interested, you can take a look at them on the DEP website. The final reports are due in June, and then our goal is to marry that up and see how it dovetails nicely with some of the federal programs, and then utilize um, through our newly formed flood mitigation program where you will have CDBG dollars in order to make sure we can implement some of those programs. So that is a snapshot of what's going on in our rebuild and recovery. Um, I could talk about it all day. I could talk about it in my sleep. Um, and I'm very passionate about it because I think everything we're doing in the state is having tremendous impact. I'll just close by saying I you know, I did my, um, my every so often drive down the shore, my infrastructure tour, as I call it. I, I drove uh, Route 35 from one end to the other. And, you know, I hear people all the time saying, we're 18 months past Sandy. What do, you, what do you mean you're spending all this time on Sandy recovery? 
and I still see the damage, the devastation. It is unbelievable, and I tell folks, just go take a ride along Route 35. Just go come into some of the areas where they were inundated with floodwaters and see that people still aren't in their homes. And it reminds me of that sense of urgency, reminds me that it can't be a business as usual mentality. And I ask that all of us keep that sense of urgency and understand this rebuild takes time and we'll be at it for years. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Queen of Water. Um, you, all, you you're all sitting probably on three by five cards. You just didn't realize it. We put them <coughs> on your, your put them on your seats, and the purpose of those is to write a question if you have one. And I'm setting Dan up for all the hard questions right now. Um, what we're going to do when we get to the respondents, we're going to collect them and then we will, uh, if we have time, it looks like we'll probably have five or ten minutes to take those questions and we'll ask the uh, panelists to uh, comment on them. So go ahead and write, start writing questions and we'll collect them up here in the next ten minutes. Um, next I'd like to um, uh, turn it over to a, a colleague of mine uh, who is running uh, the new newly formed Office of Recovery and Resiliency in the de Blasio administration here in New York City, in the island at the center of the world, as, uh, as the Russell Shorto book uh, uh, is titled. Uh, Dan uh, and I got to know each other well uh, during the Special Initiative for Resiliency and uh, Rebuilding when he was in charge of uh, uh, the coastal protection portion of it, which I like to call the centerfold of the entire plan. And, and Dan, I remember breathing a sigh of relief when that finished uh, until the mayor announced that he was the one who was going to be responsible for implementing it. Um, uh, he hasn't slept until since uh, October uh, 30th, 2012. Um, so if you have a really hot cup of coffee, you could probably use one. <laughs> Um, but I'd like uh, Dan to talk about all the activity that is going on here in New York City to uh, reduce uh, the risk from uh, climate disruption and extreme coastal storms and, and other uh, factors. Dan, thanks for joining us. <clears throat> thanks, John. Thanks for, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to the MWA for uh, hosting this great conference and bringing together a panel with some really distinguished colleagues. Really thrilled to be joined here by Holly um, from HUD and, of course, uh, put in a plug for additional trying to throw money while I can, um, while all of us are doing that. Uh, Jamie, uh, great conference yesterday, and uh, great to be here with you, Michelle. So, uh, John, you asked a question earlier about who leads on this, and I think what you're seeing up on this panel is that really all of us need to. And uh, whether it's the states, whether it's the federal government, whether it's local uh, municipalities such as New York City, all of us need to be able to step up and lead on these topics. And there's, there's a role for all of it. And there's really probably no one person that's going to lead this. There's no one organization that can see all of these plans through. Um, but what we know is that there's a lot of planning going on. Uh, we've probably generated enough paper to hold back the tide if we uh, put all of our plans together. Um, but what's really key about this, this panel today is what are we doing to implement it? So implementation is obviously key. The planning is really important. It's vital. Um, but our steps forward to actually implement these plans is even more important. And I think you're hearing um, all of those plans across the entire region. So let me just um, tell you a little bit about what the city is up to and what we've been through. And of course, We've been through, um, in the past few months, a mayoral transition, which uh, some could think could, could lend some, um, uh, some turmoil to a planning process or to an implementation process like this. And I think I'm here to, to um, proudly state that that is not true at all. And we, in fact, we've been through a fairly seamless transition on this. And the de Blasio administration is absolutely committed to this recovery effort and um, wants to see this through and to accelerate these recovery efforts so that we're making this work for all New Yorkers and all those that have impa been impacted by uh, Sandy. Um, a word on plans, I guess, um, to start with before launching into implementation. So in, in, in June, we did release the Special Initiative for Rebuilding a Resiliency Plan, a stronger, more resilient New York, uh, a multifaceted, multi-layered plan, not just looking at flood risk, looking at a wide variety of climate risks, because it's the, the next impact that we're likely to see is, not, is unlikely to be um, the last impact, uh, whether it's heat waves, whether it's precipitation higher winds, we could see a lot of different risks. And so while we're also um, very focused on flood risk and coastal storms, we need to make sure that our, um, our efforts are geared towards a wide range of risks. Um, 
the SAR report itself was multi-layered based on the best available science. The New York City panel on climate change had been called back into action to make sure that our projections were, were um, uh, that our plans were based on their best available projections. And ultimately, we laid out 257 specific initiatives um, that we wanted to see put in place in order to reduce the risk and really um, use this unique opportunity that we have right now with federal funds flowing into the region to buy down that risk for the future. Uh, we know that we'll never make ourselves climate proof, but we can make ourselves climate ready. And within that plan, and we've laid out strategies on strengthening our coastline, upgrading our buildings, protecting our infrastructure, and generally making neighborhoods safer and more vibrant. I mean, it, and fundamentally, the, the resiliency effort for us is about um, neighborhoods, and it's the places where we live, work, and play, and making sure that those are safer into the future. And so, um, heading now into the into the uh, uh, transition and a new administration here in town. Um, and it was very clear to us that the recovery was going to be a top priority um, and that we were going to be expanding and supporting these plans uh, to the maximum extent possible. In late March, uh, a, a new leadership team was appointed here to lead these recovery efforts forward. Bill Goldstein, um, uh, we were uh, thrilled to hear, is going to be leading all of our recovery and resiliency efforts for the entire city, as well as looking at broader infrastructure concerns. Um, Amy Peterson was brought in on our housing recovery side to uh, accelerate our housing recovery programs. And this new Office of Recovery and Resiliency was launched in order to um, uh, really adopt the climate resiliency plan that the city had put in place, but making sure we were expanding upon it and making it work for all New Yorkers and looking at economic opportunities that were going to be coming from these rebuilding plans. Um, in mid-April, we released the plan on how we were going to do that, and, and certainly um, uh, we could talk a bit about housing recovery and how our goals to um, accelerate the movement of housing dollars out into the communities and a commitment to by the end of the summer that we're going to see 500 homes under construction, 500 reimbursement checks. Um, out into the community uh, before Labor Day and also adopting the resiliency plan that we have in place, um, expanding our city effort, expanding our efforts with the state and federal um, partners to make sure that we're making this recovery work, and then expanding those economic opportunities. And so then on Earth Day, um, we were thrilled to release our progress report on what we've actually done. And I have probably the only printed copy of this plan. We talk a lot about our ability to measure our progress. Well, the city has done exactly that. Those 257 initiatives, each one of these, if you go through this plan, um, we've provided a status report. Where are we on each of these um, each of these programs? And so you can measure for yourself how we're doing. And you can find that um, this entire plan on our website, uh, on our Plan YC website on nyc.gov. Um, and so a couple quick highlights um, of what we're doing um, and how this has worked. On our coastal protection front, um, we've certainly been working on a short term, a medium term, and a long term focus. And on the, just on the short term, the partnership with the federal government with the state, we've seen already 1.2 million cubic yards of sand on our beaches here in the city and already moving towards another 2.9 million cubic yards coming in the Rockaway Peninsula this year. We are working to accelerate the programs with the United States Army Corps of Engineers in Staten Island, in uh, Rockaway Peninsula and Jamaica Bay, as well as in Coney Island and Seagate to expand upon those projections. Uh, protections, and also uh, through their comprehensive study that's due to Congress in January 2015, working very closely with them to identify vulnerabilities that exist here within the region and ultimately provide a pathway for additional coastal protections within the harbor. Um, <laughs> and this is very much a, a great conversation for regional cooperation because this is one shared harbor and we all need to be thinking of it that way. Um, we have a lot of vulnerabilities where the federal government and through the Army Corps has no um, has no ability to provide that extra protection. And so this is a pathway for us ultimately to find those additional authorizations and appropriations for additional coastal protection. On our buildings, we've, um, we've adopted 16 new building codes through the city council and signed into law by the mayor, um, upgrading our building code for resiliency against flood risks, adopting the most recent flood hazard information into the building code, and generally um, uh, updating our emergency preparedness uh, provisions in the building code so that our buildings are safer. And that's, an, that's a, a great first step on making sure that future buildings are safer against these risks. Um, but we also have 68,000 buildings in the floodplain alone uh, here in the five boroughs. And so we're also launching programs to incent investment into existing buildings um, to make some common sense uh, upgrades to buildings and what we call our core resiliency measures, which really translates into upgrading and elevating mechanical systems, electrical systems, and other uh, core building systems to make sure that they are uh, more ready for these risks of the future. 
Um, on our infrastructure, with the, the city, the state, and Con Ed had partnered um, and, and agreed on a settlement for uh, major investment in the Con Ed electrical grid infrastructure here in the city, um, almost a billion dollars of storm hardening of key substations and other equipment to make sure that our electrical grid, which supports so much of our infrastructure, uh, when the power you know when the power goes out, just about everything else goes out. And so by making these investments and and prioritizing these investments through the most recent rate case, um, I think we've all made a, a major commitment to, to making sure that our electric grid is uh, is hardened for those sort of risks in the future. And then a last piece, um, it, within our neighborhoods, that's been a major topic of conversation uh, is around flood insurance. And of course, the, the Bigger Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act uh, that was put in place in 2012 was having some uh, perhaps unintended consequences and uh, raising rates uh, to really unaffordable levels in some of the neighborhoods that were hardest hit by Sandy. Through the advocacy of many of the people um, in this room and um, uh, with the city, we advocated for changes that were ultimately passed through Congress and signed into law by the president to uh, slow down the rate of increase on those uh, on those policies to make sure that flood insurance remains av available and affordable, and also gives us time to make those risk reduction investments that we need to in our buildings, in our coastline. Um, and so just uh, that's a handful of things that we've been up to here in the city, and you can read about the other 253 <laughs> of them um, in this plan as, as we go. Um, I, what I'd, I'd characterize it at is, is, is substantial early progress into this plan, but let's not, um, uh, you know, we can't kid ourselves that we're done. This is not a victory lap by any means. We have a lot, collectively, we have a lot of work to do to continue implementing these plans, and, uh, and the city's committed to doing that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, uh, panelists. Um, we, we've invited uh, two respondents to join us uh, on, the, on the panel today, uh, and their job was to take good notes and then to ask hard questions of, of the panelists. Uh, and I, I was, I'd like to introduce the first respondent, uh, who's been uh, in the business of uh, the environment, preservation enhancement uh, for uh, for some time now and is a recognized expert, uh, was, pre was uh, executive director and now president of the New York League of Conservation Voters, and that's Marcia Bistrin. Marcia, uh, your comments uh, for the panel. Uh, okay, first question. Um, first, I'd like to thank all the panelists for impressive presentations. Um, they've outlined a series of plans. Um, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay. Um, the panelists have outlined uh, a series of very impressive plans, uh, but as we all know, what we're really interested in is execution. So I'm curious what the panelists think the major impediments to execution are. Coordination, regulation, politics, dollars, or something else? Yes. How's all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> Details, panelists. How about you start with Dan? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. <clears throat> oh, impediments. Um, uh, there is an, uh, there's an enormous um, desire, of course, to see dollars spent well. And I think, um, you know, nationally we've seen uh, disasters not go so well in the aftermath. And so uh, there's uh, no doubt been put in place a lot of interesting rules and, uh, you know, well-intentioned rules for making sure that money is spent well. But that also comes with it um, some time and some uh, process to make sure that we're doing that well. So it's certainly, I, I think, you know, hopefully no one agree disagrees with this up here, that there is definitely process that needs to be followed, and whether it's environmental process or whether it's simply compliance and, and checking, um, those are um, impediments to spending dollars quickly. But on the other hand, we want to make sure, we all want to make sure we're spending dollars well. And so the planning process that we put in place, it's, it, it, if we just, if we all just collectively shoveled what money out the door and built the first thing that came to mind, I don't think any of us would have really um, been happy with the result. We wouldn't necessarily be utilizing the opportunity that we have to buy down future risk in a cost-effective or intelligent way. And so there's a planning process that we need to go through. And, and I think we are now, most of us are through that process and know we, what we want to do. And now it, the, the, it's incumbent upon us to be able to deliver upon that and to work 
collectively with our federal partners, with our funding, uh, with the funding sources that are here to move that quicker. And I think they're going to be hearing lots of details from us um, throughout this process on how we think we can make this work better and how we can push the bounds on those rules to make these dollars move faster. There's going to be a lot of that. Um, and I think we just all collectively just need to get into it. I'd like to um, build on that a little bit. I think that and what takes the time in this coordination, we have vertical coordination with our federal partners and then we have the horizontal coordination you know, in the state alone amongst our sister agencies, but then also um, our counties and our municipalities. And again, I told you about that diversity before, but the one thing in terms of the taking time, and it's this balance of providing the right amount of transparency, so it takes time so that you can defend your actions later. And what peop what's very challenging from the outside is when you move fast, you get challenged because there potentially isn't that transparency. And we experienced this in New Jersey. We got our debris removal done you know, like that, but we were challenged for it because everyone said, well, you did it so fast, you got the contracts out so fast, how did you get through the procurement? So when you move fast, you get challenged. When you take your time and you line up all your ducks so that when you know the Oprah requests come in and everybody looks at it and sees you followed the federal rules, the state rules, the local rules, it takes time to set that process up. And so the delay in setting the process this up frustrates people, but we have to balance that against the need for transparency so that you all understand that your dollars are being spent in the right way. Um. <laughs> so um, I will say that I think the biggest impediment that I've seen is, um, is creative thinking on our part. Um, so I, uh, I'm relatively new to government. Um, as, as John said, I spent about nine months at HUD. Uh, a sort of a pseudo HUD employee, um, so I don't think I really learned any of the um, important lessons that you learn when you're a HUD lifer that Holly's going to, I'm sure, um, has already picked up. Um, and I'm relatively new to the state as well. I've only been here about uh, eight or nine months, and I thought before that I was 20 years in the private sector. So, um, you know, for good and for ill, I think I, I came in, and many of the people that I've hired since then to help with this work I came from the private sector or from other backgrounds. <laughs> Um, and I think, frankly, the reason that we've been able to get a lot done very quickly is two things. One, uh, I think we've actually found remarkably flexible partners in the federal government, and that's both HUD and FEMA. We absolutely have tried to do things quickly and absolutely have run into obstacles, uh, the kinds of obstacles that, um, that my colleagues here were referring to when we um, did something that was different than perhaps in style or form than people had done them in the past. But the fact is, um, every time we've done it, every time we've tried, We've talked, had a great dialogue with our federal partners, and um, I don't think we've run into one single thing that has caused us to take, um, that has caused us to um, to say that we've had a, you know, a, an unblockable, an unbreakable uh, impediment. Yeah, maybe it took us a few extra days or a couple of extra weeks to get money out the door, but in the end, they've been our partners, and I think um, everybody's, I think it's a sign that everybody's learning how to do things differently. But internally, frankly, the only times that we've ever had um, substantial delays is when we haven't applied our own, we haven't applied enough imagination as to how to do something. So these programs are in many cases versions, newer, larger versions of programs that have been in place for many decades through CDBG. And every time there's a disaster, CDBG and other, the seeds of these federal funds are called, uh, are called in to force. But you know, this, there's uh, something like Sandy really causes us to rethink again um, how we do things. And I'll give you a couple of looks. So we've, we've been challenged in that. And I think when we've actually applied our imagination and tried to think about how to re, uh, reorient ourselves against those rules, that's when we've done the best. So for example, um, our housing program. I mentioned before that we put $500 million into the hands of homeowners, which is a fairly substantial accomplishment in, in uh, the short period of time relatively that it happened. The reason we were able to do it, frankly, is because Seth Diamond, my colleague who runs our housing program, program came in, took a look at how we were planning to do it, sort of staging there's a whole uh, process, you need to figure out who it is that's in the pipeline to fix a home, you go out and assess their home, you appraise how much damage there's been, you do the environmentals, you do everything else, finally you put them in the queue and then eventually you get them a check. That can take a year and a half. Seth took one look at that process and said, why are we doing all this serially? Why don't we do it all at once? Funny thing, you can actually do it all at once if you tell HUD that's what you're going to do. Um, and six months later, we're able to get everything done. We get $500 million out there and we've got another $500 million coming with to over 6,000 homeowners. 
um, you know, you just have to use your imagination and work extremely hard. And, we'll, and what we found is that uh, the federal government is, will, is willing to help us. So I would say absolutely there are impediments, but they're getting less every day. Um, I would say that what I'm seeing is the biggest challenge is the fact that we are all being very concerted about not doing um, this recovery the usual way and that resiliency is a guiding part of it and that brings two challenges one is that it's expensive and so um, the the congressional allotment that was that was made um, I'm not sure that that when that amount of money was said it was fully thought about in the way of, well, if we want to do all of these resilient infrastructure projects plus get everyone back in their homes, how are we going to do that? Um, and choices have to be made, and we're all facing those choices now, and I think we're all very committed to not just building back, as has been done in, in a lot of the past disasters, but building smarter and stronger, as Michelle said, um, but that requires more money than if we just put back what was there before. and so coming up against those choices as the, the last tranche of money is facing us, I think is a huge challenge. Um, and the other piece of that is that when you are looking at trying to do things differently, federal government cannot be siloed the way that it could be if FEMA just came and gave you money to reimburse for building everything the way it used to be, and then CDBGDR money came in and sort of did the things that didn't fit into other categories, and DOT came in and did the transportation. If you just sort of do that and everyone's acting independently and then the Army Corps comes in and does their beach restorations, that's easier in terms of the grantees spending the money, um, but it doesn't get to the result any of us want to. And so that requires a lot of head scratching and a lot of meetings and a lot of phone calls. And it can be frustrating to try to figure out how to put all of our money together and deal with a tremendous volume of rules that weren't made to go together. And so I think this goal of resiliency is one we're all really holding on to, but it does create a lot of challenges that are both economic um, and regulatory. Thank you, Holly. And, and a great question, Marcia. Uh, uh, the answers were, were exceptional. Uh, I'm going to have to move, though, to our other respondent here. Um, uh, joining us uh, from uh, a great colleague of mine from uh, Arcadis, a uh, world-class engineering firm, is uh, Peter Gloss, and Peter is an expert uh, in water and wastewater uh, design and construction, and uh, very involved in, in Bay Park, for instance, in Nassau County. Uh, Peter, thanks for joining us, and, and what's your response for the panelists? That was pretty impressive start there, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got their attention. They all woke up there. Okay. Great. You made a splash. I did. That's right. Okay. So, um, moving from that, um, you know, I wanted to go directly to the question of money um, and just Good. sort of talk about a very basic issue. You know, we. You know, we're in this moment of sort of cultural change. These events have sort of changed the way we think about infrastructure. And there's a tremendous momentum that is being carried at the moment by, you know, these planning efforts, whether it's RBD or New York Rising or Work in Jersey or um, Plan NYC. But, you know, there's a sense that the amount of money that's driving the momentum is static because there's a congressional authorization of $60 billion. And I wonder if that amount of money is enough to actually achieve the ambitions that we're trying to pursue. You know, Chris, in his keynote address, he had a wonderful sort of historical overview of the port. He talked about it as a wealth engine to build um, our aspirational projects. And I wonder what your thoughts are. Um, you know, do you see the congressional authorization as sufficient? And what are we going to do as a society to sort of move past that and into a more routine sort of uh, approach of implementing resiliency measures ongoing through governmental agencies? So this is, this is my personal favorite topic. Um, so can I, I'll, how about we start with this? So um, it's a great question. Um, and I, I absolutely share, um, absolutely share the concern. I'm sure everybody else on this panel does because we all know that 
Um, we have uh, tremendous ambitions, as represented, for example, in the mayor's certain past mayor's SIR report. Um, and there's absolutely not nearly enough money to, to meet all of them. Uh, Fifty million dollars sounded like a lot at the time, and uh, it's amazing how quickly that turns into not enough. Um, you know, I would say a couple of things. I. I um, I think the easy answer would be to say that we need to start looking back to our appropriators, both at the state and the federal levels, uh, to make bigger commitments to things like infrastructure, and I don't think there's anybody in the room that would disagree with that. Unfortunately, political reality is such that, um, um, you know, having been through a little bit of the infrastructure bank wars as an advisor over time, um, I wouldn't get your hopes up, at least not in the current political environment in Washington. So. Uh, you know, I think clearly that's something that we should be continuing to try to hammer away at, but um, I don't think that's going to save anybody's, um, I don't think that's going to be the savior here. Uh, you know, at the state level, I think um, I've started to get to know the state legislature a little bit, and there are many people there who are committed to doing the kinds of things that we're talking about, but again, uh, you know, the state's fiscal situation, everybody knows, is not one where there's ample money lying around for things like this, or if there is, you have to start making hard choices. So, again, I, I don't think we can look to our appropriators for, for example, regular appropriations, large amounts of new money um, that, uh, that will answer that question. Unfortunately, something like Hurricane Sandy, and this has become a bit of a cliche because many people have said this now, um, is it can be a blessing in disguise because it opens up uh, the federal pocketbook to such a tremendous extent. Um, but again, that, I mean, that is, that does have sort of a one-time flavor to it. And frankly, I think that the next major disaster, if we're unlucky enough to have it hit us, um, I doubt very much that we're going to see the same kind of largesse from, um, from Congress. I don't know, maybe Holly has a comment about that, but I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, I think we, we had to fight like hell to get the amount of money we got this time. It was maybe half as much as was needed. Um, and the politics of it meant that it took three extra months to do, which is a disgrace. Um, you know, Hurricane Katrina, the first appropriation of federal money was, uh, I think, eight days after Katrina hit. Uh, and it took three months to get Sandy appropriated. So, um, you know, I, I don't think we can count on it the next time. So, frankly, I think that the only way um, that we're going to try to start to solve this position, this, this terrible problem, is if you start to bring to the table in rooms like this, uh, people who come from the industry that I came from, which is finance. Um, you know, there's plenty of things wrong with finance. Um, but one of the good things about finance, and I spent uh, 20 years uh, doing this for other purposes, is you can make $2 out of $1. Um, and when we have a bigger room and more time, we can talk about how that works. It's lots of fun. Um, but, you know, the fact is, um, you know, there's great gnashing and wailing of teeth about not being able to get money, to not being able to get people to lend private money into major infrastructure projects because you can't help them see the return. Um, and I, I think, frankly, that's just, again, a lack of imagination. I spent much of my time when I was on Wall Street uh, figuring out how to, lend, how to get people to lend eight times cash flow to a project that had absolutely no chance of being successful. Um, and, um, you know, we usually figured out a way through that, but that is, you know, that's a lot of what you do in my old business. Um, if you can't do that in the context of uh, projects that are going to protect people in this room and, and the eight million people in New York City, um, twice that New York State, the folks in New Jersey, um, against lo loss of life and limb and the billions and billions and billions of insurance losses that happen every time there's a major storm, uh, I think it's because we're not trying hard enough. So you got to get people in this room. Um, you got to get the insurance companies and major insurance companies in this room. You got to get Wall Street firms in this room and help them understand how it's part of their responsibility to figure out this problem. So I'd like to continue. Uh, for a moment. Can, can I just quickly read the federal? Because I, I just want to set the tone on one thing. I don't. I think we are mistaken if we think that this is con to blame Congress. I don't think that's the right place to go is to say it wasn't enough money. Maybe it's true, but I don't think that that's the best direction for, for us to go. I, I totally second Jamie on, on the desire, but I also think that the onus is on us to think about this. We are not a country that has had a mindset of protection and resiliency. We just haven't. We've, We've been uh, turned a blind eye to that. And I think the silver lining of Sandy is we all have to start thinking in a very different way. Um, we both spent a bunch of time with, uh, with the advisor to the secretary who's from the Netherlands and who worked on Rebuild by Design. And the Netherlands just thinks this way. And they think of this as a budgetary priority. And that isn't just government. That's business. That's finance. Um, that's goes to so many levels, and I think the big change has to be that we're not always just surprised when a disaster happens and we run to Congress. We have to make this just a part of how our culture um, operates. I think one part to that is 
um, the ability to sustain some of this federal money. So that the, the challenge we have at the state level is a lot of this money has to be spent within a certain amount of time. And you can imagine Congress wants to see results. But how do we take the opportunity to sustain some? So when I talked about our Energy Resiliency Bank earlier, we're working now on HUD approval to be able to talk about how do we extend those dollars further than what might be the traditional, and then how do we take state dollars to ensure we can marry it up for the future. But you know, the challenge with unmet need obviously becomes prioritization. And I will tell you, as being the big advocate for infrastructure in the state of New Jersey, and uh, anybody in New Jersey knows <laughs> I sat around the table at all these meetings and kept saying, don't forget the infrastructure, because if we, you know, we rebuild all the houses and we take care of all the houses, but if the infrastructure's in there, the houses don't have the services that they need. But when you have unmet need, you know what comes first? Getting people back in their houses. And so infrastructure loses. And every time infrastructure loses. And the mindset of shifting infrastructure and realizing return on investment on asset management is exactly where we have to go. You know, if we can spend money over the course of 30 years rebuilding infrastructure in a financially capable and responsible way, that beats 10 times over when you have a major pipe go down and it costs millions of dollars in a very short period of time to repair it. So changing the mindset at the local level of repairing over time with long-term asset management plans will avoid those immediate million and billion dollar breaks that we see all the time. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Peter. Great question. We've got about four minutes. I've got uh, a series of questions, and these are, are from the audience. I say that because I don't want the, the panel to blame me for this hard question. Uh, I'm just going to read this one verbatim. It should generate uh, some interesting discussion here for the next few minutes. We might end on this one. But why can't any of our leaders say the word retreat? Isn't it our duty as experts to encourage discussion of the idea? Why are we going to continue to rebuild on these barrier islands, storm after storm after storm? So I, I would like to get some comments from maybe Dan uh, Zerilli first, and, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Jamie, Rubin, and, and Michelle, uh, who was talking about 127 miles of Jersey Shore. And Dan, I think that was four tickets. Four, four minutes. Yeah, four minutes. I, I think, I, I mean, I, I would love to hear, in fact, the, uh, the, the first answer to this from the uh, uh, former district commander of the United States Army Corps of Engineers <laughs> and, and what the United States Absolutely. Army thinks of the word retreat. Yeah. Um, that would be probably there where I'd go. want to start. Good job. Good job. Um, but I guess let me, let me say that sometimes the word retreat can, um, you know, some people think it's just a, it, it can be a panacea answer of, hey, we shouldn't be here, so let's move. Um, put this in perspective. We have 160,000 people living on the Rockaway Peninsula. Um, what does that mean to say retreat um, when we have established neighborhoods? This is where people have grown up, live, work, play. Um, and we know from the analysis we've done that there are, uh, there are cost-effective investments that we can make to buy down the risk um, out into a foreseeable time frame given what we know about these risks, and we can upgrade our buildings, and we can protect our beaches. There are things we can do to make that risk manageable. No one in life is ever going to be 100% safe. I think that's a, um, you know, well, I'm not sure if that's taboo to say, but I think it's true. And we need to be cognizant of that, but we also need to be cognizant of the fact that we need to be reducing risk everywhere we can. And that is really the underlying fundamental um, principle of the plan that the city has put forward, is reducing risk um, and making neighborhoods safer. So that's our approach to this. And if in 100 years, then there's other factors that have come into play at that point, this is like this is a generational um, response that we're all going to need to be thinking through. And this is going to be monitored over time. And this, these are going to be long-term risks. And so the solutions are also going to be long-term. Um, I, I totally agree. I, I, um, uh, I agree with, with, with well, both what Dan said factually and also the spirit of it. I mean, I, I think retreat is important, but it's really, um, it's absolutely not a panacea. I think it, um, one of the things that we've seen, and we, we have, um, unlike the city, we also have the responsibility of dealing with Irene and Lee, uh, which takes us far upstate uh, over to the southern tier and then up to North Country, almost up to, um, well, anyway, up, you know, past Albany and, and to the north. Um, and so we've seen many different kinds of, uh, many different kinds of damage and the result of many different kinds of storms. One of the things that um, I would say that shows us is that uh, retreat 
while it seems like it's the right thing to do, so we're treating in the case of upstate, we're treating from, for example, the banks of a river that floods all the time, really doesn't solve the problem. Um, you know, riverine flooding is a whole Dan, I'm sure knows better than I do, is a whole different um, is a whole different thing. You do this hydrological study to figure out where the flooding is actually coming from, and you discover that moving a house where it seems like the obvious thing, move these houses away from the river to this point. Um, uh, doesn't really do much good because with the problem that's actually causing the flooding is 15 miles upstream somewhere. Um, you didn't do anything to fix that. So we're trying to focus on root causes as opposed to simply getting people out of the way because the fact is if you get them out of the way now, they've got to go somewhere else and where they end up is likely to be just as much of a problem. Um, our strategy retreat has been quite, to be quite tactical. Um, I mentioned the buyouts that we've been doing on Staten Island. We're partnering with the city on a lot of this work. They've been great partners for us. What we're trying to do is rather than buy out every single, every single home, um, that uh, that's on a floodplain. We're doing it in a tactical way, only where there's clear neighborhood consensus and where there's a just an extreme danger of repetitive flooding. Um, and then we're trying to find some targeted properties that, with, if we reduce them down to nature, they're going to be um, absorbed into the various Staten Island Blue Bill activities that are going on. So we increase the amount of protection that we get, not just move people. So there's, we're trying to kill as many birds with one stone um, as is possible. Anything I would say would be repetitive. <laughs> you, you both said it perfectly. Okay. Okay, with that, I think that's, that's time. So let's give uh, the panel and the respondents a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, we have a lot, of, I know there are a lot of great questions, and uh, maybe a couple of panels can stick around afterward. You know, we can pitch it home. Uh, we're, we're running a little behind. Uh, so I'm going to ask you guys to get out short. Of <laughs> Uh, get back to your seats and uh, as the next panel comes forward, I get uh